Birds at War presents 83 Days, the story of Seaman Izzy. Who? Izzy. Izzy. Uh-huh. Izzy what? Just Izzy. It's my last name. Izzy. Some last name you got. What's your first name? Basil. Basil, huh? Your mother didn't like children, maybe. <laughs> Anyhow, take it easy, Izzy. Fly out flat. Yeah. Which of you guys is the Navy man? You, Izzy? Yeah, me. Seaman's second class in my rating. American gun crew on a Dutch merchant ship. How long were we out there? 83 days. What happened? We was torpedoed. <laughs> About 4.30 in the afternoon of November 2nd, 1942, a fast Dutch cargo ship was torpedoed and sunk a few hundred miles off the coast of South America. Only a few of the 400 men on the ship survived. And one of them, Basil Dominic Izzy, seaman second class of the United States Navy, was found on a raft in mid-ocean nearly three months after the sinking. Tonight, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, brings you the incredible saga of Seaman Izzy and his companions. Words at War presents 83 Days by Mark Murphy. It was torpedo, huh? Yeah. Then what? Oh, nothing much. Nothing much we could do. We was off watch when it happened. Me and Jowdy, he was my buddy, and Jensen and a couple of others. I forget now. Anyhow, we was playing poker. Jawbone poker. Jensen owed me close to a million bucks by then. How much? A million bucks you owe me. And don't forget it. Fat chance with you hounding me for it. Come on, deal. Yeah, you wear the spots off shuffling them. Well, take it easy. I'm dealing, ain't I? You deal like my old lady. Don't forget the pot, Andy. uh... I forgot. You forgot? Yeah. For 3,000 miles, we have to tell you every time to Andy up? Sure, that's how he won the million bucks. I open. I'll play. I'm in. How many cards? I'll take two. How many? Me three. Okay. Dealer right. takes one. I'd laugh out loud if we got torpedoed now with Jensen owing Izzy. Torpedo! Jeez! Right under us! A million bucks. So we caught a fish. That's what you call it, getting torpedoed. You call it catching a fish. A fish is a torpedo, see? Me and Jowdy hit the deck running and checked in at our gun stations, but it was no use. By the time we got there, the ship was so far down by the head we couldn't get elevation on the gun. So we took our shoes off and went over the side. It was cold. The water, I mean. Boy, was it cold. It's cold! What do you expect? Steam heat? Izzy! Yeah? That you, Izzy? Yeah! Me and Jensen! Who's that? Me, Johnny! Come over here this way! Keep yelling until we find you! This way! Over here! Here I am! He was hanging onto a raft. Not really a raft, just some bamboo sticks lashed together. We could hardly see Johnny the sea was running so high, but we finally got together all right. It wasn't big enough to climb up on, so we just hung on and watched the ship go down. There it goes. And all my clothes on it. I paid a hundred bucks for one of my suits. A hundred bucks. Too much for a suit of clothes. Two of the lifeboats got launched before the ship went down. Just two of them. We watched while they pick up as many men as they could carry. There was no room for us. It was tough to watch them put up their sails and shove off, leaving us there on the water. They were sorry about it too, all right, I guess. You could tell the way they looked when they went by. They kind of waved at us. And when they were way past, one guy leaned out and yelled back at us. Good luck! What'd he say? Good luck, he said. We'll need it. Good luck. With a little luck, we could have been the guys in that boat going someplace. After a while, it got dark. 
Then it was real tough, real bad. Lots of men died that first night, all around us. We could hear them, yelling sometimes and crying. I heard a man crying like he was a baby. After a while, he stopped. Drowned, I guess. I didn't wish him no harm, but I was glad when he stopped crying like that. It was a bad night. We lay there in the water, clutching onto the raft. It was a bad night. Around morning, we got a kind of a laugh, though. It's I, Rock and Bar, out of the west. This guy, see, he was an ensign named Fox. He came drifting by on a hatch cover, riding it like it was a horse. And he had a long bamboo pole, and he made out like he was one of them knights. You know, like Come King on, Arthur had. Come on, be gone, you rascal! Well, be when the gone. sharks came around, this ensign would take this pole he had, and he'd stab at them in the water. And then they'd go away for a while. When they came back again, Ensign Fawkes would sock him again with the pole, and all the time he kept on riding this hatch cover like it was a horse. It was a kind of a laugh for a while. Until the sun came up. It was tough in the night. But when the sun came up, you couldn't get away from it. You could turn your back to it, and then it would reflect off the water like from a mirror. And it would stab in your eyes like it was going to tear off the back of your head. All day long it was like that. Just hanging on and cursing and dozing off once in a while... And waking up at the edge of the raft, cutting into your belly. And the sun making scrambled eggs out of your brain. Nobody said much that day. Nobody talked. Just hung on and puked and waited for the sun to go down. After that, things got worse. Everybody started seeing things off their head, even me. The stars were big and close. They looked like the lights on a ship, and they blinked like the blinking lights on a ship. I was sure there were ships all around us. Then I smelled smoke. I noticed a big hole in the water not far off where guys was going down for a cigarette. And I let go of the raft and I started swimming away. Where's he going? Watch him. Where are you going? It? I feel like a cigarette. I'm going down for a smoke. Down to where all those guys are coming up from smoking. Is he? Come I got back, hamburgers. Want I should bring you a hamburger, Johnny? Not now. Later. Come back. He brought me back to the raft. A half a dozen times he did that. And I kind of, I kept seeing things and would swim off. All night it was like that. And the second night. Then when it got morning, I stopped seeing things. But not everybody did. Not Jensen. Listen, you guys. There's a hill on the other side of the raft. Jensen. There's a hill on the other side, and I think there's some German spies got a place there. And I'll, I'll bet they're pretty nice guys. Jensen. Sure, I'll bet they're nice guys, even if they are spies. You can get us plenty to eat from them. All fixed up. I'll be right back with it. Jensen, come back. Let go of me. Let go! That's just for that, I won't bring you nothing. Jensen, come back, Jensen. There's no hill there. I won't bring you nothing. Only you and me, Izzy! That's what you got me! Jensen! Jensen! Here goes my million bucks. <laughs> So Jensen went off looking for the hill. There were others, Satterwhite and Autrip. They swam off looking for a hatch cover. Underneath it was supposed to be a case of beer. And Kasowich, he thought he lost a book. I gotta get back to my father. I got a book for him and I can't let it sink because I gotta get it back to my father. Only there wasn't any book. And after a while, Kasowich let go of the raft. Then there was no more talk about books. It came morning again, and the sun came up. It was like the day before, only nobody had any beans left by then. Except Ensign Fox. He was still riding the hatch cover like it was a horse and stabbing at sharks with that pole he had. Only he was getting kind of dopey by then. No sleep. He'd doze off a little, his head would lean forward, and he'd start slipping sideways. And then all of a sudden, he'd catch himself falling, and he'd straighten up quick and kind of shake his head. And then start slapping at the water with his pole. Bacon! Oh, you rascal! Bacon! It was like that all morning. Bacon, you rascal! Then I saw the raft. The big raft. 
The one we were hanging on, it was just bamboo. It hardly floated. But this other one stuck up out of the water a couple of feet. It was about ten feet long. I told Jowdy about it. I said we ought to go over there and get on it. Too far. You'll never make it. Come on. It's too far. Come on, will you? Go ahead. You want to go? Drown yourself if you want. It's your funeral. It's too far. I started out by myself, finally. It was a long way off, and it felt like a year swimming toward it. After a while, I saw I couldn't make it the way I was going, and I swam to get in front of it and figured the current would bring it down to me. Then I couldn't swim anymore, hardly. I just lay there in the water with my legs aching and my life jacket digging into my belly and giving me cramps. All I could do was lay there, just wishing that big raft would come my way and talking to it like it was human. This way, I'd say. Float a little to the left. A little more. Don't be scared. Left. A little more left. That's a good raft. That's right. That's the way. Left. A little more. Please. Finally, it bumped into me. And I climbed up on it. For the first time in 48 hours nearly, I was out of the water. There were four other guys on the big raft. All the rest of the day, we spent in trying to paddle the big raft over to where Jowdy and Ensign Fox were. But it wouldn't go. It wouldn't go. Well, finally, I was so pooped out, all I could do was just lay there and look over where the others were. I couldn't see Jowdy and the other guys in the water. I just knew where they were on account of Ensign Fox. I could see him. Still riding the hatch cover like it was a horse, and he was a knight. Every once in a while, he'd start to go to sleep, and then he'd wake up and start poking the water with his pole again. After a long time, I didn't see him anymore. He must have gone to sleep, and not woke up in time. I lay there on the big raft, and I cried. Once upon a time, there were three bears. Mama bear, papa bear, and a little baby bear. Like I told you, there were four other guys in the big raft. One I knew, Ensign Maddox. He was my gunnery officer on board ship. Then there was Beasley, an American sailor, and Case Vanderslot. He was a Dutchman who could hardly speak good English. The fourth guy was a 17-year-old Dutch kid named Hugendam. Nico Hugendam. Well, you can't go around calling the guy Nico or Hugendam, so we just called him Junior. He was from Holland. And he was crazy about American bedtime stories. All day long, he'd make Maddox tell him bedtime stories. Oh, look, Junior, I told you this one five times already. For two weeks, I've been telling you about the three bears. Haven't you had enough yet? <laughs> I, I like it. You go ahead. Please. Huh? The little baby bear tasted his porridge, and he said, My porridge is too hot. The first month went by then fast. The Mama bear tasted then the days porridge. began to get funny. We were running out of food and water. There was ten gallons of water and a big can of chocolate when we started, and we rationed it out until it was almost all gone. Then the days got funny. The mornings would go fast. Every afternoon was like a year, waiting for night to come so we could get our little piece of chocolate. And every day, Maddox would tell Junior a bedtime story. Once upon a time, three bears, Mama, Papa, Baby Bear. They tasted their porridge. Nine, nine. You leave part out. Porridge. I could use some porridge myself, whatever it is. Hey, Izzy, what's porridge? I don't know. Oatmeal, I think. I don't know. And I wish you wouldn't ask me every time you tell that story. Oatmeal. I could use some oatmeal. Come, you you finish the story. No, no, no more. I, I'm not going to tell you any more bedtime stories. Uh, please. No. Beasley was the first. After we ran out of food, we took to catching little minnows that came alongside the raft. We did them raw, bones and all. Only Beasley couldn't keep them down, so he started getting weaker. You could tell, because it got so he couldn't hear. I can't hear. I can't hear, Mr. Maddox. Well, what's the difference? There's nothing to hear anyway, so what's the difference? I can't you hear. hear. I can see your lips moving all right. I know you're talking, but I can't hear you. What'd you say? After that, he started going blind. And it got worse and worse. We'd come up to him and hold up four fingers in front of him and say, 
How many fingers can you see, Beasel? What do you say? How many fingers can you see, Beasley? Two. Is that right? No. I'm holding up four fingers, see? One, two, three, four. Can you see them now? I only see two. December 3rd was my birthday. The day before, I told the other guys about it. How I'd never been away from home before on my birthday. Here I am, out in a raft in the middle of the ocean. Now, never mind, Izzy. We'll be in New York or Brazil for your birthday, and you can send a telegram home or maybe even call them on the phone. Yeah, sure, Izzy. How are we going to be picked up in one day? My birthday's tomorrow. Never forget... It, it takes only one half an hour for a ship to come over the horizon and come over and pick us up. Sure. When the boat rescues us tomorrow, we'll tell the ship's cook it's your birthday and he'll bake you a cake. Sure. If we get picked up today, we tell him tomorrow is your birthday and you get cake anyhow. The next day was my birthday. It rained. Hours went by, and we still talked about my birthday, and it kept on raining. It rained the hardest of my birthday that it ever did while we were out there. They tried to cheer me up. Oh, never mind, Izzy. We'll be picked up tomorrow, and we tell ship's cook yesterday was your birthday, and he baked you cake just the same. That afternoon, it rained so hard, I couldn't see more than a few feet in front of me. And I cried, my head out in the rain and tears rolling down out of my eyes, because I knew if a ship did come by, they couldn't see us. I was 20 years old that day. Christmas came. We were out 53 days on Christmas. By that time, we were all pretty far gone. I was so thin, I could put my fingers all the way around my arm. Beasley was the worst. I'd like a cigarette, Alice, please. He just lay there and talked to himself or to people we didn't even know. He was dying. Case Vanderslot, the oldest Dutchman, kept singing some kind of Dutch song. Nico, the kid, he slept most of the time. Maddox sat on the edge of the raft, turning his head as far as it would go from one side to the other, watching the horizon. Once in a while, he'd beat his hands against the edge of the raft. And after a while, he said... What's he singing? Who? Case? Some kind of Dutch song. I don't like it. It's driving me nuts. If I knew the words, it might not be so bad, but not knowing the words is driving me nuts. Shut up, Case. Me? Who else? What's the matter? I said shut up, I said. Okay. Okay. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. So I use Noel. And a Happy New Year. <laughs> you know what I'd do if I was ashore? Shut up. I'd walk down the street and I'd go into the first five and ten cent store I came to and I'd get me some fig squares. That's what I'd do. What is this, uh... Fig squares. The little cookies. They get ground up figs inside, you know? And the five and ten, they're always fresh. I never yet. heard of a fig square. Sure, you know. They're kind of cut off at each end, and you can see the ground up figs inside. Maybe you mean Fig Newton. In Lafayette, Indiana, we call them Fig Newton. Not where I come from. Where I come from, they call them Fig Squares. In Lafayette, they call them Fig Newton. Please, Alice. Why don't you help me? I'm over here, Alice. Alice, can't you see me? On the 66th morning when we woke up, Vanderslot asked me how Beasley was. All night long, Beasley had been moaning. In the morning, we looked at him to see how he was. He was dead. His hands were out in front of him like he was grabbing for something, and his teeth were showing. We knew he was dead, but we kind of watched him for a couple of hours, hoping he would move. But he didn't. And then we were sure he was dead, and we took off his dungarees and... Got ready to bury him. Somebody ought to say a prayer. How about you, Izzy? You're a good Catholic. 
All right. I'll say something. Oh, my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. But most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve... When I to say push, you guys push. ...to my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. Dear Lord, this is our friend. Take good care of him. Amen. 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 He's probably going to a better place. May he rest in peace. Push. After Beasley died, nothing much happened for a long time. We had a couple of arguments on the raft. It got so Maddox wouldn't talk to Vanderslot, only to me and the kid, Nico. Vanderslot and the kid were sore at each other, too, so the only one on the raft who would talk to Vanderslot was me. When the others wanted to tell him something, they told me, and then I told him. Hey, is he? Yeah? Tell him to st stop singing. Nick says to stop singing. Tell Nick I said for him to jump overboard. He says for you to jump overboard. Yeah. Tell him I, I said no. He says no. Doesn't seem to bother you much, Mr. Maddox. What? I said it doesn't seem to bother you much. What doesn't? The Dutchman singing. It used to bother you. Singing? What singing? You, you can't hear him singing? What did you say? Can't you hear him? Listen, can't you hear him? Go on, sing some more. Did you hear him? What did you say? How many fingers? How many fingers am I holding up? How many? Two. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, that's right. Two. But I was lying. It was four fingers I held up. Just like I used to for Beasley. Maddox was deaf already and was going blind, just like Beasley had. He was dying. He lasted ten days after Beasley. That night, the 76th night, he was groaning away all night. Now and then, one of the Dutchmen would feel him to make sure he was all right. The next morning, the 77th day, when I woke up, Nico, the kid, was watching me. Uh, you... you awake, you see? Yeah, boy. Uh, you, you better look at the officer. Is he worse? Uh, you, you better look at him. Good morning, Mr. Maddox. How's it coming? Hey! Mr. Maddox! Mr. Maddox! The village <laughs> is... Uh... It, it happened early in the morning. We... We didn't want to tell you. We should bury him right away, I think. Yeah. Take off his wedding ring. He used to talk about it. His wife told him to be sure to come back with it on, or us it would be bad luck. Yeah, then maybe we should leave it on. No, no. His wife will want it. Pete Hine, Pete Hine, so we buried Maddox at sea, Pete like we had Beasley. This time we watched his body. His hair was off along by then, it floated out in the water, and we could see him drift past us and then back, back 50 feet or so, his hair floating out in the water. And something jarred him. His hair fluttered in the water, and we didn't see him anymore. Then one morning, Vanderslot woke up Nick and me. Listen, listen, you guys. What? Listen. I can't hear anything. Yeah. There it is. A plane. A plane. A plane. They started yelling at the plane, hey. waving. Hey. Standing up and then falling down. Hey. I just lay there, sick to my stomach. Hey. I couldn't hear the plane engines. I knew what that meant. Here we are. I put up four fingers in front of my face. Here. I could still see four, but they were blurred. We are here. I was next. He, he didn't see us. Well, anyhow, we are, we are where planes are. Maybe, maybe the next one. He, 
He didn't see us. <laughs> We saw two more planes that morning, just scouting, not looking for us. They were just scouting. Then early in the afternoon, Vanderslot, the Dutchman, he saw some smoke. He rubbed his eyes and he said, I don't know, but I think I see something on the horizon. We couldn't see anything, but later on we saw it. We saw one ship, then two ships, then four ships. A convoy. It just went along the horizon. We just looked, and then Vanderslot said, If this misses us today, I jump overboard. There were planes flying around the convoy, and the first ship was a destroyer. We wanted to try and stand up, but we kept falling down. The destroyer kept going fast around the convoy, and then we noticed some smaller boats, some PC boats, sub chasers. Yeah. Then a PC boat headed right for us. Stand up, Case. Come. Yeah. Wave, wave the flag at them. Hold me up. Yeah, hold, hold me up. You here. They're coming. Yeah. Should we yell? Tell us what are they Look doing? Shut up! Should we yell? Shut see. up! Hold me up! See, I'm holding you. Tell us what, what are they, they doing? doing? What's happening? Shut up! No, shut Please up! Tell you. me what's happening. Yeah, they're coming you? closer. They? Shut up! They see us. They see us. Well, what's the matter with them? They're pointing a gun at us. Yeah, they're going to shoot us. No, no, they ain't. Look, they're flying an American flag. They're going to pick us up. They picked us up. We wound up the day in clean sheets. The 83rd day we were on the raft. Three months. Later on, a guy from the Coast Guard came down to feed us. He fed us like we were babies, with a spoon. Take it easy. What's your name? Izzy. Izzy. Uh-huh. Izzy what? Just Izzy. It's my last name. Izzy. Some last name you got. What's your first name? Basil. Basil, huh? Your mother didn't like children, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, take it easy, Izzy. Lie out flat. Yeah. How long we out there? 83 days. What happened? We was torpedoed. <laughs> As the 17th program of Words at War, we have brought you passages from the recently published book, 83 Days, The Survival of Seaman Izzy by Mark Murphy. This book tells the true story of Basil Izzy, Seaman Second Class, an ex-baseball player from South Barry, Massachusetts. The radio adaptation was by Edith Summer. Seaman Izzy was played by Paul Mann. Others in the cast were Paul Gordon, Tom Hoyer, Kenneth Lynch, Myron McCormick, Bill Quinn, Jackson Beck, and Glenn Anders. The original music was composed by Morris Mamorsky and conducted by Max Goberman. The production was under the direction of Joseph Losey. Next week, Words at War will bring to you passages from Paris Underground by Etta Scheiber, who, with another woman, organized an underground railroad smuggling British soldiers out of conquered France. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. (laughs) 